address. And welcome to you. I'm uh, happy you're all here. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> Akim told you that, um, yeah, I worked for over a year on this. We started talking about this um, possible project way over a year ago. And the idea was um, to show the show Le Livre, and then I think we came to talk about uh, conversations because I, I believe that uh, meeting people and having a conversation is one of the most important things in art or maybe in life. <laughs> so the so in this book you find <coughs> yeah, a conversation I had or tried to have with Bertrand Marchal. Um, Bertrand Marchal is a very famous guy in France, not here, uh, not yet, I think. Um, and he, uh, after uh, Scherer, uh, came with this, uh, you know, spectacular publication of Le Livre, uh, uh, Marshall came with the, with his um, view on what uh, Le Livre actually is, um, just uh, a bunch of notes. So it's not a book, and it's we we just talked about it before, like, and we talked about it, and I think we all talked about it. Like, it's very confusing. Uh, to, to expect it to be uh, a book. And I took this confusion with me to Paris and I uh, confronted <laughs> Bertrand with it, uh, uh, or he confronted me. So his, um, yeah, he said, these are only notes uh, while looking at Le Livre. So um, I'm gonna be very brief about what you're gonna expect this afternoon. I invited, uh, three very uh, amazing people, uh, specialists in their own field, already introduced by uh, Akim, uh, David Morato. Uh, his focus will be on um, uh, Mallarmé's uh, uh, impact on modern art, the influence. He will take us uh, a bit through a coup de day. You have indeed a handout that I um, made so you could ha have a look while we are talking. Um, some texts will be read by me. Some texts will be read by you in silence, no worry. And after uh, David uh, Rinske Hillen, <coughs> she's a writer and a philosopher, um, will yeah, sketch this framework, right? On um, symbolism, for instance, one of the things. And I, I will ask her, a question about uh, morality or immorality whilst publishing someone's work against his will. That's going to be a very fascinating topic, I think, we all will discuss. And um, third is uh, Misha Andrusen, and he will talk about, yeah, as a poet, about a lot of things. I think one of the things maybe I'll ask you is uh, the invention of new words, or what we talked about uh, the, the, the pathway Mallarmé created for new languages um, to, to come into life, actually. Okay, so, um, yeah, we are inside of, the, of a book, and um, one of the ways one could look at uh, Le Livre is, uh, I, I read this recently online, and I was actually quite irritated because this person said, um, yeah, it's uh, this Mallarmé uh, left us with this very hermetic, obscure um, text that is impossible to understand. And um, yeah, my thoughts were, so what, why is it a problem that it's not understandable? Because um, I think one of the things I really like about what I have uh, learned about Mallarmé so far is this passionate um, quest of trying to find some kind of perfect truth. So we're gonna talk about this as well. And I would like to um, give the floor 
to David. Uh, he will talk for a little while, uh, say, call it like a mini keynote. Rinske will do the same, and Michel will do the same. If you have uh, questions, and I hope you all do, uh, you're invited to ask them more at the end of our salon. Uh, you can write questions down. Anyway, um, so uh, you told me that you you thought that the um, not only the livre but the work of Mallarmé was of a, a really important influence on modern art. Can you take us through the yeah. different people that were you know affected in a good way by yes. uh, his thoughts? Yes. Can you like this? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to summarize very brutally uh, something that could take, I guess, a whole symposium <laughs> <laughs> to unpack. But uh, I think, at least, that if we are still speaking of uh, Mallarmé today, it's not exactly because of his poetry, because with his poetry, surely he's uh, one of the most important French uh, writers and poets, that's for sure. But I doubt that we would be speaking about him if, ha if he had not written, uh, well, the full uh, title is, um, excuse my French, Un coup de deux jamais n'abolira le hasard, sorry for my French, which in English means a throw of dice will never abolish chance. He published this poem like short before he died and probably not in the way he had planned originally, but we can talk about it later. But with this poem, I think he opened some doors that then they were continued in the 20th century because he published it in 1897, the same year he died. And then let's say uh, two strands were opened, yeah? One in uh, modern poetry and one in modern art. Can I, can I say something very small to yeah. help you for the audience? Um, why we think this uh, Ancou de Day, also Akim, is very important because this was, was published just before he died and Le Livre, or the note en vue du livre you see, uh, after, but there is some kind of um, link between the texts. Okay, yes. just um, you know why we made this choice and uh, please feel free to look at uh, the simple and very small example we gave. And I know Akim has, uh, you have the poem right here on Coup de Day, right? You have the normal, the uh, if people want to look afterwards and uh, be able to read it. Yeah, no, yeah. You, you are right. Of course, if we make the connection between, yeah, you came here to uh, for us to speak about the book, and now we are talking about another poem. <laughs> Uh, I think there is a connection, I think, uh, <coughs> because the book, as probably will come clear today, doesn't exist. I know, I know there is a book that is called the book, but it's not the book that Mallarmé wanted to write. He never actually wrote it. Uh, in his mind, uh, it's not clear how he could come about it because in, it was a kind of metaphysical, kind of ideal form of literature, a little bit like Akrim was saying, like uh, for an idealist like him, um, you know, the material world uh, seems something kind of dirty, messy and disappointing. So any kind of formal expression that this book would have would not be the book that he wanted in his mind. So I think if you read through the notes that are also, also called the book, to make things very confusing, but the notes uh, kind of explain that he had a kind of permutation system in mind where the book would never be published in one final form, but every time would be published in probably somebody else will. Yeah. Uh, but I just wanted to make the connection, yeah, otherwise good. it's not clear why. Yeah. So this idea of variations on the same uh, ideal piece of literature, I think, is what led him probably to write uh, this poem, A Throw of Dice, which uh, in these uh, few pages that you have in, in this reader, you can see one double spread. And as you can see, the first thing that calls your attention is that he didn't write the, the, the poem following a kind of a standard layout, yeah? uh, but he was treating language, or rather said, the written expression of language, that is text, um, as material. 
Yeah. So um, when when we read, so we are so used to read that we don't really look at the text in a way. We scan the text and say that um, we decipher the semantic meaning of the words in a kind of automatic pilot. And I think what Malarmé wanted to do was to kind of uh, put something in between this transparency of the text, to make us aware of the text by, um, uh, so that we linger on the material expression of this text. So in, in a way he's using yeah, the text as material in the sense that he is playing with the space on the page the situation of the text on the page. And in that sense, if you look at it uh, a little bit, um, it's not exactly clear how you have to read it. Yeah, I mean, of course, you are going to go uh, from left to right, up and down, but some, there are moments of a little bit of ambiguity, like, because these are two pages, okay? These are a double spread. So sometimes you don't know if you should stay on the page or jump to the next page or uh, go up or down as this kind of non-linear way to treat literature, this way of treating um, the text as uh, material, and this way of making you aware of your own role as a reader, where you have to make choices, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is a kind of performative aspect of literature that I think that's what I wanted to say. Mm. <laughs> Finally, um, it opens uh, two different strands, one in modern literature, uh, in modern poetry, and another one, curiously enough, in visual arts, in modern art. So um, again, I don't want to make it too long, but I will kind of try to get take to the point uh, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, take time. If we uh, speak about literature, um, I think the first stop we have to do is with uh, Apollinaire and the calligram, where I don't know if you have it in mind, but Apollinaire, he would uh, write poems where the text is kind of outlining a shape, a kind of drawing. So maybe it's a horse, maybe it's the portrait of somebody. So the, 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 the text is giving you information on two levels. One is the symbolic meaning of the letter or the, of the words, and one is the visual or the iconic uh, um, information that the, that the text is giving you. Um, but then I think more crucially even, uh, in the 1950s, we start to have what is being called concrete poetry. It's a kind of movement that really could have never existed if not because of yeah, the calligram and the Mallarmé, this kind of lineage that arrives. I will read how it's been defined. So concrete poetry has been uh, defined as, uh, it's not a style, but a cluster of possibilities all falling in the intermedium between semantic poetry, calligraphic, and typographic poetry. So, Let's say there is a visual syntax based primarily on a spatial relations between words and letters. Many concrete poems have no conventional beginning or end point, but are perceived initially at least as a visual whole. The poem is not considered not so much as utterance, so it's not only the sound that it produces, but also exists as an object in the world. And uh, I mean, I, I have this anthology of concrete poetry here, and if you, almost if you open, um, any page? Almost mm -hmm. any page, but I'm going to look for one in particular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you are going to see that, uh, yeah, the text is pretty much, also there is an influence, of course, on uh, graphic design by the 1950s and 60s. So how, yeah, you have all these letters spread on the page. Um, how are you supposed to actually read it? It's a lot up to you. Um, I want to look for this Dutch uh, 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 landscape. But well, basically you have here the treatment of the, of the text, yeah, that it's... Um, but you mean that uh, rhythm becomes more important than legibility or...? Well, that at least the, um, the information you get from the text as a picture, as an image, mm -hmm is as important as what the text is actually expressing, yeah. let's say. You mean in meaning a, in a and form? Yeah. It's like mixed together, it's a Yes, synthesis. at least it makes you uh, aware of it. But also, again, there is no a single way out. This is the one, it's called the Horizon of Ho Holland. Hmm. 
And while you, you are like, what is, why is this? But then you start to see the windmills, yeah? And uh, you see the horizon line, and, uh, and then you start to read, what is this? And then you start to read um, the horizon, and then you read, uh, you start to find words that are actually connected with the picture, and then everything kind of makes a whole. So it's, of course, it's very playful. Sometimes it's very abstract, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like, uh, well, I don't know. It, the, the, the possibilities are endless. So you see how uh, here poetry gets uh, one step very close to visual arts. Um, and then on the other hand, you have in uh, modern art. And here I, I would like to, well, I was thinking mm -hmm. that after concrete poetry, you have visual poetry, which maybe is even a step closer, but maybe we can talk about it later. But just not to make it very long, I would say that in visual arts, I think the first artist that I think considers Mallarmé like really very important would be Marcel Duchamp. Mm -hmm. um, there are many parallels between the two of them, but Duchamp said many times that Mallarmé, uh, together with uh, Raymond Cousel, was his favorite writer. Um, so uh, there are many parallels, like both were working in a kind of secret project uh, for a long time. People thought that they were not producing anything, but they were like just quietly and in silence. And uh, actually, um, uh, it's a kind of protracted process, yeah, where Mallarmé was maybe writing, uh, working 20 years in a project that end up, ended up basically nowhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was working on it. It's a little bit like Duchamp working on the large glass, no? In silence for eight years. And, work, uh, and also, uh, you know, working and also uh, talking about it, yeah. sharing the process. I think that's also very important because I think I talked to you, about, like he was talking, to, uh, writing mm. letters to, to all his friends about this ideal work he was going to make. Yeah. Yeah, it's a way to make it live in the world. Exactly. Uh, because yeah. otherwise, uh, you know, that's the problem of metaphysics. If you don't, you know, if you don't get dirty with this idea, yeah. it's not going to find an expression in our world. So it, it's as it, if it didn't exist. So, but what I find interesting is that uh, Duchamp's uh, large class, uh, everybody knows his work, uh, has been defined as a text, a painting as a text. And I think it's a kind of mirror image of Mallarmé where his text has been many times approached as an image. Um, but also, I think what Duchamp liked about Mallarmé was the precision of his language. Yeah? He didn't produce a lot. Uh, before, uh, in, in his lifetime, Mallarmé would have chosen just 50 poems of himself to make a kind of, OK, this is the output of my whole life, 50, which is not so much. But if you look at Duchamp, he also created just like about 20 ready-mades. Mm -hmm. So they were very conscious about streamlining their own production. But I think, and just to end uh, this first uh, short introduction, I think the artist we really have to speak about is Marcel Broders, a Belgian artist. Um, you have the image of uh, Brodhaar's work on the next page. So yeah. just gonna guide them through. Yes. And this is exactly, I made a copy, it's the same pages of what you, you maybe you can tore it apart if you want. But you see the picture here? Yeah, it's just the same. Well, I think something important to know about Brothers, uh, not only that he was uh, Belgian, but also that he, uh, until he, uh, he became 40 years old, he was a poet. He wasn't an artist. He was a poet. Um, and then he decided to become an artist um, to invent ways to give material form to language. In a way, he didn't give up his interest. He just changed the approach. So his first artwork was a bunch of uh, unsold copies of his book of poems. So he, an image of his uh, failure as a writer, he made a sculpture out of it. He put a, a lot of plaster around it and he made it a sculpture and he, it was the first exhibition he had. So it was also a kind of manifesto in a way. Mm. Um, but Mallarmé, uh, Marcel Broders spoke about Mallarmé saying that he is at the source of modern art. He unwittingly invented modern space. So it's true that um, uh, Mallarmé, uh, sorry, Brothers made a version of uh, a throw of dice. Uh, it's an exact uh, uh, 
uh, facsimile, but here he blocked out the text with solid uh, bars of black color. What was he, what was he trying to achieve? Well, it's a little bit like um, uh, he, he was trying to emphasize the visual aspect of the poem, like going just one step in the logical <laughs> direction, mm. like um, uh, just getting rid of, you know, the, 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 the semantic meaning of the words and just stick to the visual composition of the text on the page. I'm just trying to think of, imagine someone seeing this for the first time and not knowing anything about, for us it's impossible to go back because we know, we all know all the steps, but I don't know. If anybody here mm -hmm. uh, has seen... Well, for me it like looks a little bit like a score in a way, it mm -hmm. brings to mind, but actually Mallarmé, he himself defined <clears throat> his own poem as a score. And I think with this I stop, but maybe we can go back to this mm -hmm. later, because he himself said that his poem made most sense when you read it out loud. And this is very important, that his text, his uh, poem, that is, uh, like we said, a spread and so on, it makes most sense when it's not read silently, like we are used to read silently uh, with this kind of a strange voice in our mind. We don't mechanically produce phonetic sounds or rarely, but this, um, if you think about the way we read, we put down our head and our eyelids and we create this kind of cocoon around hmm. us and we isolate from the wall just to get into the text. And again, it's not a voice really, but a kind of strange voice and the, 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 to kind of bring back this text into the world uh, is relatively simple. To make it a performance to the audience, you only have to look up and read and project your sound into the space. So the text becomes now part of a situation that can be shared with more people. And I have to say, and I can stop here if you want, <laughs> that um, about, uh, we have writing for about 5,000 years, more or less with writing is the beginning of history, but for 4,000 years, write, uh, writing, sorry, reading has been done out loud. So reading in silence is a kind of relatively, uh, relatively uh, um, recent invention. Um, so I think Mallarmé was really onto something. So it's kind of paradoxical that being like the most modern of or the father of modern literature, he was actually going backwards in time by making his literature, his poetry, something that had to be shared, had to be performed, had to be uh, making a kind of community in a sense, instead of his rather bourgeois, you know, conception of the self, just consuming the text in the isolation of your living room. It's very interesting what you say. So I think, yes, we should pick that up later uh, when we talk about the role of reading in this kind of um, yeah, communal aspects uh, is very important. I am uh, leafing through the text, I'm kind of hesitant. Um, did you uh, read the first texts? Uh, maybe can I ask you to just read in silence? <laughs> um, it's, it's on the first page. Uh, it, this is also kind of an introduction uh, for Rinske's uh, part. Um, you find just a fragment from a letter Mallarmé wrote to Paul Verlaine uh, about the book.
So Mallarmé cherished this idea of the book. Um, in several letters and texts, he expressed his concern, his ambition, his self-doubt even. And during this life, he developed different ideas about this possible concept of Le Livre. He didn't want it to be material anymore, but a new shape, expressing unreachable limits of literature. And um, yeah, I was developing these questions, and then Rinsk and I talked to each other several times. And um, yeah, you told me, can you give us a little framework? Like, where does this idealism come from? How? Yeah, can you elaborate on the framework? Yes, I think to, uh, am I hearable? Okay. Um, I think to understand what it is, it's important to zoom out a bit and to place uh, Mallarmé, uh, whose work and influence was of course like in the second uh, part of the 19th century, um, but until now still, um, where, where we can place it in the history of literature of that century, but also um, the framework of the mind, the, 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 like the philosophy, uh, the way people thought. And I think it's interesting to go back a bit to um, Romanticism, um, that was obviously in reaction to uh, the Enlightenment and the industrial time and a more mechanistic, mechanistic way to view life, and the Romanticist wanted to well, returned to the pure, authentic self and the uncivilized. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also it had like this uh, intense worldview. And after that, uh, we can see in literature, for instance, the, the, the realistic and naturalistic movements of, for instance, Tolstoy, Flaubert, Post. And this all has, has to do with um, I mean, we hear it, this theme, I think, all the time when we speak about this. It's about the infinite reality. Uh, like, there's endless, endless opportunities and the possibility to grasp a bit or to, to, to nail it or to, yeah, to get a sense of it and put it in words or in music or, or anything. So you mean this is where he got his idea of this unreachable limits, to have this idea of this... Un unreachable you yeah, have to believe it's it is reachable or it sounds like a paradox yeah it is it, it is mm -hmm. a paradox it is constantly a paradox of knowing you can't reach it and still have the courage to try i think that's that's the constant paradox we're in in this talk and in viewing what he did um but to go back to uh, to where he came from it's the 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 realist they wanted to show the the real life, the authentic life of normal people as well. And after that, the naturalistic movement was about uh, showing also the criminals or the prostitutes, like everything. But still there's this belief that you can um, represent reality, you can mimic it, you can tell a coherent story. And this is what makes it interesting. Uh, it's also the time of uh, Freud and Nietzsche and uh, the, the discovery of the subconscious. So it's like this big paradigm shift, and I think he was really influential in that, um, that we start to lose this uh, conviction that it's possible to get like one current story or to grab it. And um, what's interesting that at the same time or a bit before, it's the, there's the decadent movement, and um, it is, it, it's starting, what, what's interesting to know is that in this time, the daily life is changing as well, like the daily uh, relation to language in the sense that there's newspapers for everyone. Like for instance, Virginia Woolf says, uh, and I don't think she meant it snobistic, but she said uh, nowadays even the cook is asking to, to borrow your newspaper. And I think it's, it's important to understand that, it, that this was happening at this time, that it feels like language is being hijacked by the normal daily life. 
and the decadent movement is is in a way uh, you said hermetic, but like it's it's more aestheticism. So it's trying to it's called l'art pour l'art. It's the phase where people want to well make it pure again, get it uh, back to uh, well the pure aesthetic. But then um, there's Mallarmé, and he is really the founder of symbolism. I think, or he starts to, for instance, defend the Impressionist, like Manet, um, and he is speaking about uh, the same things in a way as the decadent, but then it's different as well, because, and this is what you just mentioned, about the, it, it's more spiritual, it's more mystical, it's like really trying to ask the big questions and to relate to the infinite. That's different from the decadent, I think. Is this yeah. a moment to maybe, um Read the Symbolist Manifesto, or yeah, that's would fine. that be? Yeah. Um, so you find that, um, well, you see Wittgenstein on top of the page, but we're ig ignoring him for now. So you see the Symbolist Manifesto, Jean Moreus, 18 September 1886. In this art, senses from nature, human activities, and all other real world phenomena will not be described for their own sake. Here, they are perceptible surfaces created to represent their esoteric affinities with the primordial ideals. The Symbolist Manifesto describes a new literary movement, an evolution from and rebellion against both Romanticism, as Rinske said, and Naturalism, and it asserts the name of Symbolism as not only the appropriate for that movement, but also uniquely reflective of how creative minds approach the creation of art. Symbolists believed that art should represent absolute truth, which could only be described indirectly. Thus, they wrote in a very metaphorical and suggestive manner, endowing particular images or objects with symbolic meaning. Moraeus announced that symbolism was hostile to plain meanings, declamations, false sentimentality, and matter-of-fact description, and that its goal instead was to clothe the ideal in a perceptible form whose goal was not in itself, but whose sole purpose was to express the ideal. So that's quite something to swallow. <laughs> yes, yes. So. Uh, a few things you can find in here is that it's, as I said, it's it, it's, um, it's it's more about the universal, and that's a bit different with the romanticism. Um, you, romanticism is more about my specific feeling or my sentiments towards, like for instance, this special person, and then we have this special love. Whereas in the symbolistic movement, it's more about the archetypal expression of feeling and emotion. So like uh, Munch, for instance, it's like, what is jealousy? What is, um, wh what is uh, having, is losing? What is love, etc. Like trying to find that. So it has to do, like Mallarmé uh, expressed it in its first suggestion, and it's about the effect it has on the, on the viewer or the reader. And that's also a big revolution, I think, like a paradigm shift. It's also what you named, the the role of the viewer, reader, etc., that becomes creator, not only receiver of a rep representative reality, but the one who has to associate as well. And I think um, also it, it, it makes use of um, of course, of symbols, but it also goes back to um, the historical or biblical, etc., elements. And um, for me, I thought about it, and it's what in what's interesting as well is that it's like, for instance, this poem, "The Saint." It it's not about uh, the old times, but it gives the association of the old times. So it uses words that make us like go there, like in a dreamy or subconscious feeling of m mel melancholia or nostalgic, for instance. And I thought about it and I thought it's, for me, it's, it's something that really happens like in modern dance, for instance, that when I, or, or contemporary dance, when I'm there, I, I'm often wondering more well, what is happening that I feel like I'm, I'm in the old Egyptian times, for instance, but there's nothing that says here's 
here we are in, or I, there's no pyramid, or there's no mummy, whatever. There's, but something is there. That's it's very funny you mentioned dance because I think Mallarmé also uh, yeah. made this uh, comparison of between d dance or th theatrical performativity and what he tried to uh, mimic, actually, yes. via his words. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm saying this correctly, but... Yes, I read this as I mean? well, that he's really um, relating to that and loving the dance, because it is a direct way, I think, to get us into this state. Yes. Um, yeah, so, and then after him, uh, or, or he has, of course, and I think you will speak about that as well, but he has, like, lots of influences, but also like on modernism, that uh, there's more and more experiment and more and more avant-garde and more and more, um, well, yeah, playing with the idea that that there is no truth, there is no st strict uh, way of representing reality, yeah. I, f I feel like I want to jump to Plato now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking of, you know, idealism. And we yes. talked about this before. And um, it's also a discussion I had with Case at Heart. Yeah. Um, and that's why uh, we decided to... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I think you probably all know uh, Plato's cave. But um, maybe it's a nice reading moment. It's on the... Previous page, just underneath the Broodhaars, um, so you can read it quietly. Akim, do you have it? Yes. So, um, people are still reading. Is it enjoyable to read? <laughs> I just want to know. Yeah? Good. Um, yeah, how should we look at this? Uh, well, I think in common interpretation, but there's no common interpretation, of course. Well, um, I think it's just almost impossible as a philosopher to to look at Mallarmé and not think about Plato because mm. indeed of this idealism but um, for, for Plato as you can read in this part but in general there's this uh, philosophy of ideas and it means like there's an there's this concept of an ideal world and the real world we're in so the daily world and um, it, th the idea is that li there's like a lot of horses or a lot of trees and they all have like common aspects, but there's the ideal tree and the ideal horse in the ideal world. And um, th uh, Plato believed that it's the philosopher who's capable to get out of the cave, at least for a bit, and see some <laughs> light and see something of the real, yeah. of the realness, of the truth, of the beauty, whatever. And then comes back and trying to formulate that to people who can only see the shadows on the wall. It is actually very funny text because it was written in a dialogue form, right? Yes, in, uh, yes. in the state. And, uh, yes. So then f of course the philosopher is the, the guy who can guide us of through course. all and this. Uh, in a way, like uh, like the poets at can actually, yes, yeah. It's now uh, the poet who can do that, maybe, or try to do it. I mean, that's, is, that's the whole par paradox. It's very smart about. in a way, yeah. 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 Actually, there is a 
<clears throat> sorry to interject for a second. There is no, a poem good. by Mallarmé called The Window, and it's in a way it's very similar. No? The poet gives his back to the world of dirt and illness, and, and he's about to die, but he wants to look through the window into this world that he cannot reach, but you know, it's clean yeah. and it's pure and <clears throat> it's full of nature. And in a way, it's kind of a version of this yes, uh, myth, no? uh, somehow. Well, it and he can communicate it back, but exactly, uh, he yeah. cannot access it. Yeah. Mm. It's beautiful, but also sad. It's not, th that's just unreachable. Well, it's right? sad because, well, I mean, he creates this kind of ideal metaphysical dimension in his mind, and of course, he's setting himself to be disappointed, but because, you know, yeah. there's no reason to create this kind of metaphysical religious uh, dimension that doesn't exist. I mean, no, it has to do it. with this, it is a type of religion. And also a type, and also you can derive, as in Plato's sense, a uh, whole ethics system, system from it, right? Yes, well, you say it's sad, and I agree with you that it's almost like a religion, it's almost like an, a religious uh, attitude, um, but uh, I think it's very moving. And it's a fundamental question, how do we relate to this? And uh, for instance, like the Tao Te Ching from Lao Tzu starts with the Tao we can speak of is not the real Tao, mm. and then the yeah. book starts. And Wittgenstein writes a whole book and says uh, all that we can speak about, or uh, what you can't speak about, you have to be silent. We have the quote. Yeah. <laughs> it's here, you can look at it. We decided just one sentence, yeah. right? So that was your, actually your suggestion. So yeah, whereof one cannot speak. Thereof, one must be silent. Yes. And what would we, what would we do here now? <laughs> if this exactly, I that's mean that's like I think it's courageous to keep on doing it, and I also it it's what appeals to me in the work mm -hmm. that we do go 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 and ask for the big questions and not give up. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I have a few questions for you. I want to save for the end more. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to move to Misha. <laughs> and um, yeah, Misha and I decided to um, look, have a look at Après Midi d'un Fon. Uh, or actually, I, I, I think I asked you, like, what uh, poem of Mollarmé should we read? And you find it. People already are <laughs> leafing through it. Um, I was thinking, how did we get there? Because it was actually something uh, Rinske said to me about ambiguity. Okay. And you are going to say something about ambiguity in this poem, maybe. So I'll read it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so f in the English translation, Fawn, those nymphs, I want to perpetuate with them so bright, their light rosy flesh, that it hoovers in the air, drowsy with tangled slumbers. Did I love a dream? My doubt, horde of ancient night, is crowned in a many a subtle branch, which, remaining the true woods themselves, proves, alas, that alone I offered myself as a triumph, the perfect sin of roses. Let us reflect, or if the woman you describe represent the desire of your fabulous senses, fawn, the illusion flows from the cold blue eyes of the most chaste like a spring of tears, but the other old sighs, do you say, she contrasts like the warm day's breeze in your fleas? But no, through the still and weary rupture, stifling the cool morning, Eat heat should it struggle. No water murmurs unless poured by my flute on the thicket spricklet with melody and the only wind quick to escape the twin pipes before scattering the sound in an arid rain is on the smooth untroubled surface of the horizon. The visible and serene artificial breath of inspiration returning to the sky. So Misha, what is this ambiguity 
What what can we take from this poem? The well, the, the whole uh, poem is about um, uh, a situation which probably didn't happen. So uh, there's a uh, um, one who is um, trying to last a moment that didn't occur. He, he thinks he has chased some nymph. And, um, uh, there's one wound he has, but probably he has it from the Forms of the Roses. And um, so he's trying to last a moment that didn't exist. But as a poem, it does exist. So in language, uh, it, it becomes manifest. Uh, so it's all about the things that um, uh, slit through your fingers uh, in life, and which I think poetry is about. Yeah, in, and in also what Mallarmé's poetry is about, to make something real in poetry that is an illusion in life, or how? Well, um, I, I guess in, in, in context there are, are a couple of things um, important. Uh, Mallarmé was the most extreme, but he was not alone. Uh, Many artists in the 19th century uh, believed that uh, the formal aspects of, of every art form has, had become exhausted and too restrictive. So they were looking for ways to get out. And, um, <clears throat> and the other thing is that in, in literature, that because of the um, changing print, uh, printing process, uh, for the first time there were novels being printed just to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, beforehand, it was a, a very um, expensive um, thing, so it was elitist, was just for a couple of um, uh, people. And now the, there were novels uh, written especially for a larger audience uh, with no other purpose than to sell. So this whole thing that we still have between uh, pulp and, and high literature comes from there. So you had someone like Edgar Allan Poe who said, I might be dying in the gutter, but still I'm much better than all these people that write these um, uh, things. And I guess Mallarmé took that to um, uh, a large extent in, the, in which he even, um, you, you mentioned L'Art Poulard, uh, art for art's sake. Um, I believe he didn't want uh, to have art to be useful even to such an uh, extent that even meaning would, would still be useful, so he yeah. got away from meaning as well, from, the, from the, uh, the definable meaning of his work. And he, he opened up, so he first changed the rhythm, then he changed the melody, and then he left punctuation out. And then um, I, I just read that you can um, read the poem um, uh, David uh, chose, uh, also from the from the bottom to the top. You mean the coup de day? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he, um, if you read them aloud, some words get a different meaning. So he opens up everything in the poem. And that is his, his biggest uh, influence on, on modern poetry. Yeah, yeah but you, you also told me that he loved to play with words um, like coup, that they would mean different things. Or yeah, really? he was very precise. So it, you. You can read a lot of poems in, in two or three ways uh, because of that matter. Some words don't mean anything really, but they mean something when you say them out loud. So he, he's opening up to theater. He's opening up to um, uh, all kinds of arts. And there is no, um, no definite form anymore. And um, my, my students often ask me, when is a poem ready? And hmm. then I say, okay, you, you decide yourself. But a um, much more interesting question is, do you want a poem to be ready? Hmm. Would it be nice if a poem ages like you do or changes mood uh, like you do, uh, things like that? You, said, you just said something. I, um, yeah, so this uh, system, almost systematic um, I'm going to say this wrong, getting rid of form or getting rid of punctuation. Or, I mean, you said he was like a pioneer and it actually led to futurist movement or this whole movement uh, of people who really thought that through a new language they would create new people. Yeah, I, I remember I, I, we talked about it. Like um, Nietzsche was mentioned, I think, uh, 
um, when people decided God was dead, they, they replaced them first with symbolism and uh, a kind of ideal, um, <coughs> uh, the poem in itself being ideal. Um, uh, Malamé changes the focus back to the language itself. He, he, he puts a lot of emphasis on the words itself. Um, what he did, uh, knowingly or not, was that he showed that you can uh, rearrange a system that has been there for years. And um, if you can do that in literature, I still think this, you can, might be do that in society as well. And that is what you see in the, at the beginning of the 20th century with the, both futurist movements, the Italians on the fascist side and the Russians on the communist side, and they um, believe that there's a new language needed for new people. Yeah. I'm processing the consequence of these thoughts. I mean, that's very extreme. And I'm trying to, to uh, think back, where could I link this to? Well, there are two, two things. One is, uh, the dance was mentioned. Uh, there's a strong belief in some that poetry is connected to the old ritual uh, from, from the prehistoric times. Um, and there is another belief that there might be like a um, uh, or language, some, some language um, mm. from which all languages stand. Mm. And that in some way you could uh, retrieve this language. Um, also, it works the other way around. So, um, Kuchonich, a uh, futurist poet, said, uh, the bourgeois befuddled the word rose, so I cannot use it anymore. So we ha I have to make up a new word for it. Yeah. Well, speaking about new words, um, maybe you heard it when you walked in. I had this, uh, you heard some music, and there was also this very funny, I think very funny French podcast on, uh, called, it's called New Words Mallarmé May Have uh, Invented. And some of them he did, and some of them he didn't. And I asked you, what is the word? Petiques. Yeah. And I, I never heard of it. But uh, yeah, can you elaborate a bit about this in invention of, it, it's more precise than the language uh, thing, like new words. Um, why, why, why did he do that? So what, the words that were there were not sufficient enough? Or yes, I guess. Why and, um, well, as a po poet, and, and Mallarmé has, has this, you have a strong belief in that, that you, um, uh, there are many ways to say things, but um, what, what is the correct word? What is the correct um, order of a sentence. He worked a lot with that. He, he, he puts words not in the uh, order where you would expect them, but where they get most attention, where they would, would be the strongest. So he's, he, um, again, he's freeing up language, freeing up the word, exactly bringing up um, the word to the essence of, of poetry in that it, uh, it has more or, or one or more meanings. It has a symbolic meaning, but it also has a, um, a sound. If it has more than one syllable, it has a rhythm, it has a melody, it has a physical aspect. And all these things become um, important, and he's the first to do so. And, and um, he, he's the one we should thank or blame for the two questions every modern poet could get, uh, gets asked every day, um, what does your work mean, and why is it still poetry? It's, this, this starts here. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking when you say essence, and, and when I th think, when I look at Le Livre, um, my the first word I think of is minimalism, like, he left little behind, and he was in this desperate search of truth behind the words, like, um, I'm not saying that you have to answer this question, maybe all of it, how, how many words do we need, actually? Would it be, is it possible to, to kind of end up with, I don't know, just nothing or one word or? Maybe I should rephrase like, um, maybe I should bring it back to Le Livre. Like, how would it have looked like 
from some kind of ideal uh, strive for minimalism, because that's what I actually uh, get from it. And then we can maybe jump back to your uh, promised explanation on the reading and spacing. Or maybe we should, could do this first. Can get back? So the role of the reader in all of this, this, this dynamic actually, um, maybe to clarify, uh, because that's the most important thing. The, so the, the dynamic, I think, between the work and the writer uh, and the person who reads it. And you said something interesting about the history of reading quietly. Mm. Um, yeah, if you want. I can <coughs> put it on the table so we yeah. have one we'll more element if, to if play we, with. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking that maybe it would be interesting because we are talking about Mallarmé and his legacy and well, his context and then his legacy. And I was thinking maybe it could also go back in history. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start somewhere and I will end up with Mallarmé, I promise. <laughs> but I'm Spanish, okay. so I make yeah. a lot of detours before I make my point. So. I'm sorry, be patient. Um, okay, so we have writing as uh, writing appears in different places around the world, but in Mesoamerica, in China, in India, in Egypt, but first of all in Sumer, in the south of Sumer, uh, sorry, in the south of uh, uh, Mesopotamia, which is Sumer. And that is a very long process that takes thousands of years, but let's say that writing as we understand it, uh, as visual instructions for the production of uh, phonetic sounds, it kind of comes about 5,000 years ago, very roughly. Now, uh, that's <coughs> of course the beginning of history as well. So for 5,000 years, we have writing. But until the eighth, no, until the ninth or 10th century, uh, writing was uh, done largely without punctuation and there was also not a space between the words. It was called a scriptura continua. If you look at any cuneiform clay tablet or any ancient Greek text or Latin, ancient Roman, um, you're going to see a string of signs and there is no separation between the words. You don't know where a sentence ends, at, at least at first, at the first sight. Why? Because uh, writing was meant to be read out loud. Mm. When you hear yourself, and this is something that if you do it, you are going to see that it works. When you look at it, it's like a wall of text, but when you hear yourself pronouncing these uh, sounds, then you are going to decide, okay, this is the end of a, of a word, this is the beginning of another, this is the end of a sentence, and so on. So read, uh, reading was necessarily done out loud. It was really mechanically produced. Yeah, I was gonna just say, like, since we're all writers here, I think we all, relate to this, that when you're actually writing a book or a text for the other to read, there's a huge difference when you start to read it. It's yeah. like almost crossing over into this other Yeah, it's a good exercise person. my supervisor told me, she's a writer, I'm not, that uh, when you're writing, it's good to read out loud. You must know better than me <laughs> to hear how it sounds, really. But the, the, the thing is that um, you might think, yeah, but we don't do that. Normally when you take the newspaper or you read an email or a book or whatever, you don't read it out loud. You don't need it. Why? Well, uh, you have to think in Europe, there's a situation around in the Middle Ages, around the 8th, 9th century, where uh, languages in Europe, uh, in, you know, in the former provinces of the Roman Empire, uh, Latin starts to develop into different languages. So the monks that were copying the old books to make new books, they start to see that Latin is not their mother tongue anymore. Latin starts to be a second language, something that they don't grow up learning. Mm. It's now they speak French or Spanish or German or whatever. So when, you know, this is a process that takes centuries. So when they have to copy books in a language that is, you know, something they learn at the school, let's say in the academia, but it's not their mother tongue anymore, um, they start to find useful to, uh, so all the ambiguities that the reader had to solve in the act of reading out loud, like deciding what is a sentence, what is a word and so on, all these ambiguities start to be resolved 
uh, by the writer now, by the scribe. Mm -hmm. uh, by the scribe. Mm -hmm. So the scribe, knowing that his readers will have maybe problems to understand the text, he starts to decide what is a word, what is a sentence. So space between the words starts to be added. And it starts, uh, first of all, in uh, monasteries in uh, Ireland, in the British I uh, Islands, because as you can imagine, their language was the farthest apart from Latin. So then in the 9th century, 10th century, it starts to go to the north, north of France, expands to Germany, France, and then eventually Italy and Spain. It takes centuries, but the more alien the language to, uh, from Latin, the, the easier it is to take uh, this new invention, which is separation of words, and punctuation. Both things are developed at the same time. So okay. what happens? So, yeah. so actually, um, uh, what, what actually happens through this influence of Mallarmé, or what you said, is something really revolutionary. Yes, I just, right? uh, just yeah. to end my yeah, story. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that uh, when you have all these visual instructions, uh, separation between mm -hmm. words, punctuation, reading out loud is not necessary anymore. So you can simply scan the text with your eyes. You don't have to produce the, the, the sound. And you have this strange voice mentally in your mind. Now there is a different connection between the reader and the text. It's more intimate. It's easier to reflect on what you read when you don't have to do the mechanical effort to produce the sound. So it changes into the books become smaller. You can put it. Hmm. It becomes the modern reader is kind of invented. And what I wanted to say um, is that uh, paradoxic paradoxically, Mallarmé is bringing writing a few centuries backwards. Yeah. Because yeah. now uh, Duchamp said, this is a sentence from Duchamp, since I don't completely understand him, Mallarmé, I find him very pleasurable to read for sound as poetry that you hear. Mm. So in a way, there is this, again, like I said, performative act of reading, which is now, if it's done out loud, it's not for you, it's for others. You have to think in antiquity also, mm. the reader, not everybody could read, only a few people, and reading was always done also for others who couldn't read. So it's a kind yes. of shared moment, it's very performative, and if you want, then we can take it back to Malarmé's ideas of the theater and exactly, and, uh, all and this, also uh, uh, what's uh, the notes. Uh, thank you so much for sorry. this. <laughs> no, it's sorry beautiful. If I spoke too long, no, 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 <laughs> absolutely not. But uh, yeah, for the other, like uh, I'm pointing to this book, to Le Livre, the liturgic uh, ceremonial aspects of being read to, you know, like the the priest and then the people in the so. Uh, we have 24 chairs here. Not all, all of them are occupied, unfortunately. But <laughs> uh, the 24, well, we count ourselves. The 24 refer to the number 24 in, uh, in Le Livre. So, uh, See, yeah. yeah, he was very focused on sexagesimal system for some reason. Yeah. Most of the numbers that uh, recur all the time are based on six. Uh, which also is coming from ancient Mesopotamia. <laughs> Maybe it's funny. It, uh, <laughs> well, this is uh, actually a question I asked uh, Bert Bertrand Marshall. I'm not sure if it's in the book, but I think you remember, Akim, when I, I asked uh, Bertrand about the numbers, and he said, yeah, that's uh, how many pages, and blah, blah. And uh, every poet is, uh, d does something with symbolism and numbers, and I asked you, you said something very clever. Did I <laughs> say something about numbers? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what it, uh, well, the, uh, um, yeah, you, you said something, but I didn't write it down. <laughs> well, the, w w what what interesting to me is that um, uh, Malamé doesn't he, he he changes everything, but he doesn't lose faith in the uh, importance of poetry. So you have a lot of. Uh, uh, I don't know the word for build a storm, but you have a lot of um, people that are um, destroying from a, a renewal that is like a destroying of old forms. He didn't want to do that. He just want to renew them. And um, he did it in, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, besides the talking out loud, if you leave out the punctuation, the order of the words, you can make other connections. So you make 
uh, it's possible for the reader yeah. to find your own direction yes. within a text yeah. that is not written out for you, but that you have to find yourself. So it's more difficult, but it's mm. more rewarding mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, so there are more interpretations at the same time. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. Um, more money, more <laughs> work for the same money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And um, I guess the idea that the world was knowable uh, was, was changing, but it was not gone. And uh, for instance, uh, the Russian poet Vladimir Klebnikov, he combined the sound of birds, uh, mathematics, and um, old Slavic languages to create a new language that would be the Zaum, the Zaum. beyond yeah. beyond reason, yeah. so that there would be uh, it would be possible to create a language that. Um, would not be understandable by reason, but would be understandable in some other way. And for instance, he uh, calculated the black square from uh, Malevich and said it was perfect, it was how the world should be. Yeah. Yeah, Don't yes. ask me how. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly, yeah. You said a few very beautiful things that I really uh, was touched. You said um, if you found in Mallarmé uh, um, a holy belief in the power of poetic means. And you said also when I, s I we talked about uh, being a poet as a profession, and then you said, no, for Mother Mary it was a conviction and a calling. <laughs> yeah. We could end right here, but no, we're not. <laughs> because that's really something. Because then, then um, but now I'm going to say some weird stuff maybe, then you really believe that you're a, to a tool it's, it, I think it goes really beyond the ego. Like if it's a calling, yeah. like people get called faith for faith or whatever, but it, it does go in that direction, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I promised Rinska that we were going to talk about this immoral. I'm going to see where I have the question. Ah, so um, I think I said this in the beginning that the. Uh, Le Livre was never meant to be published. Mallarmé did, did not want it to be published. It was published uh, anyway. The notes were shown to Paul Valéry, and uh, then they were published by Scherer. And you and I talked a bit about, I asked you, is it immoral to print or bring out something against uh, the maker's will? And you said some really interesting things about Okay. Um, well, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, I think otherwise we wouldn't sit here and... Um, um, I think it's a matter of integrity, though, and of humility. So it has to do with the integrity of, of course, the person who selects or publishes, but also of the reader to constantly realize that this is the case. Uh, and in history, of course, there's so many uh, beautiful um, work that that we wouldn't want to have missed, like, of course, Kafka, but also, like I just mentioned, Lao Tse, Tao Te Ching, was never meant to be published. Strindberg, you said? Strindberg, yeah. he's a writer, and he said he really like said it explicitly on a, uh, about his occult diaries. This is my last will. I don't want it to be published. Um, uh, but also, uh, of course, it depends on on the integrity again, like for Nietzsche, his sister, who was obviously close to him, but she was not like in temperament or in maybe in intellectually or on a soul level his, well, the, the right person for him to understand his work and he really damaged it. So it, it definitely depends. And also why I think it's not uh, immoral is that it's, um, I think there's a difference between the artwork and the artist himself, and also like specifically for, for Mallarmé, um, there's this image of the spider web, that when you see the spider web, it's the work that is created, and you do assume the, the spider, but it doesn't have to be there, like mm. the, the artist is, is gone from the work, but not. <laughs> yeah, so there's this par paradox again. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very important thing to realize, and also like time will tell if it's, if it's I think there's some objectivity and some, uh, well, of course, also technical, but quality that we can, if we are in, we are, we have integrity. We can just 
value it, even though we don't have the explicit permission of the artist. But of course, this is my um, interpretation. So well, I don't know yeah, what you yeah. think about it. No, I mean, <coughs> I, thought I think it's uh, interesting also to, to realize all the myths ar around uh, so-called found worth work Right, and uh, that's also something I asked Bertrand. Like, so the word notes were burned. So what is what you actually saved is not. Um, this is just a frag, or just a fragment. <coughs> so we are dealing with notes of an unfinished work. Um, yeah, I don't know. How do you, how do you both feel about um, this practice of? publishing or showing something against the uh, maker's will. I mean, Do you agree on with the one Einstein? hand, mm. I'm thankful. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, as a kind of ethical principle, I think it's wrong. Mm. Uh, we are used not to respect the artist's uh, desires. And I think we yeah. should maybe start to take into account what the artist actually wants, uh, mm. just as a kind of general rule. And again, I'm very thankful because, of course, there is something into looking into the creative process and uh, you know into the mind of Malarmé at work. That uh, it's you very can private, right? Yeah, 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 because these notes were never no. written to be read. No, not exactly. by somebody else. No. Um, but we are doing it anyways. So of course, it's great. I mean, yeah. I, I, am, I am thankful, but that's not what he wanted. So in a way, we are betraying the whole purpose of whatever he wanted to do. And that's why it's so confusing, because we are taking something that is not a work as a work, and it wasn't intended like that. But then again, I don't know, it's, it's a tricky question. But as a general ethical question, I think we should maybe start to take into account not just, uh, you know, because the death of the author and all this stuff mm, that was yeah. written 60 years ago, maybe we should start to think that even even Roland Barthes started in his latest uh, books, he started to put the author back into the picture, yeah, yeah. the desire of the, of the author and not just a kind of text that appears there out of nowhere and we can do with it whatever we want mm. and take it left and right and make it mean the opposite of what uh, you know was the intention. I think that's not exactly right. No. That's my very personal How opinion. do you feel? Uh, what do uh, you think, Misha? The short answer is yes. <laughs> ah, okay. And you, audience, does anybody want to respond? We, we are kind of uh, open now f for questions. We're kind of opening the door <laughs> for the for your questions to come through, if you have them. Thank you very much uh, for this very inspiring talk. And I was maybe my uh, question would be first to you in how you approached the not so much description, as, as I understand. I haven't read it yet, but uh, you approached this work. And in, my back, in the back of my mind, I have to explain, I'm also a lawyer. Um, how do you evaluate certain things that are subjective? And one of the ways you can reach the classification of what is better or less is by reaching coherence, searching for coherence at least within the system. Is this something you recognize? Is that something we might use in approaching other people's work? Do you feel? You mean specifically now in uh, dealing with well, you, you chose to approach this work that was not to be approached, as I understand, by Madame May herself. Um, did you seek for a certain kind of coherence between your approach and his approach, as you saw it? Yeah, because I think we need a... F yeah. Uh, I can reply also to the question of um, Emily, because... <coughs> As an initiator of the project, I find a very absolute uh, question, are you allowed to show something which is like supposed to be uh, not released or shown to the, to, the, to the audience? So I think it's important to understand this project that the most important part is on this table. Maybe this small little movement will be published. And yeah. the small little movement was published because um, 
I, I saw the urge that we have to continue, that we, as a reader, we, we, we have to continue and we have to produce something new. And there was my struggle, like, who could I find, who could I ask to dare to do this difficult task? And so therefore, I approached Emily, because I thought he was the, he would be probably the only one who is capable and who is uh, daring enough to, to do that. So I was very happy that she uh, <laughs> uh, did that, because I'm, I'm very, very serious about that. Like, um, with the projects, what we do at West, when you do something which has a kind of historical um, public reputation, you like, nobody will dare the, the, the relevance of the Malamain, but then you take something which nobody ever reflected on, hardly anybody dares to touch it. Because everybody says, oh no, I don't touch it, because I, I, there's nothing I can refer to. So I think it's very, uh, uh, we have to be grateful to uh, Emily that she, uh, that she did that. She, she dared to, uh, to reflect on that and, and to work on it. And I, I, that's all, um, because it's, it's, it was quite a difficult task. Uh, the only way to start was to go to Bertrand Marchal because he, he worked on, f for his whole life, worked on this. And uh, also because uh, he is a very severe <laughs> academic. Um, so a lot of my questions, I mean, I just, that, I just put the conversation in basically how it went. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm capable of um, packing up my, my uh, shame or of not knowing stuff and just ask it anyway, because uh, then you get a proper severe response. <laughs> but uh, it was actually very stressful, I must say. It was all in French with this translator, and it was wonderful at the same time. Akim was there uh, in this very old library, so... Uh, not knowing much, and still actually still not knowing much. We talked about this, like, uh, you can spend so much time <clears throat> on this and, and somehow it's ungraspable and it's, uh, that's a good feeling also, I think. Um, I want to ask you, did I leave anything very important unfinished? Um, I have a lot of questions, but they seem trivial, and I think we kind of addressed them, most of them. Um, well, actually, what we didn't, uh, oh, yeah, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. It's actually what you said in the beginning, Akim, like everything in the world exists to end up in a book. You said booklets. No. Yeah, that's <laughs> um Maybe it's nice to reflect on that, because I find it a very scary, I think of biblical, like everything in the world exists to end up in a book. It's not the, he didn't say the book, and he, he said this in Igitur, uh, so he did not say this in uh, Le Livre. He was referring uh, to this ideal book, of course. P please, guys, help me. <laughs> um, How should we live? Should we live like this uh, inspiring life so uh, somebody can write about it? So or what is it? What can it mean? It, or what does it mean to you? Well, when you say, how can we live? I think about the, the, the thing you said before, that it's actually all what we're talking about and also the morality of talking about this. It's all like a metaphor of the whole work itself in a way like he has this ideal trying to reach it we we trying to reach this as well like it's all the same but to go back to this quote of his I think it's a it's a you can look at it in multiple ways it's like a statement or a question or a provocation and for instance Susan Sontag she said everything is there to end up in a photograph hmm. or nowadays you can say everything is there to end up in a post so it's, it's yeah. it, that shows us that, um, of course, we are all narrators. That's that's the whole mm. issue here as well. Like we are all, na all narrating life, and at the moment we narrate it, it exists. But it's I think also more to him. It's also saying that when you have infinite reality, and you you're trying to capture it in a book, he's actually saying or stating or provocating that it's worth more 
than the experience itself. And that's, well, you can think a lot about that, but it's, it's beautiful. It's again the, the, the attitude of the, of, the, of the priest or the, the shaman or the one climbing up the cave. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's what, I, what c comes into my mind. Yeah. And at the same time, he doesn't want to have the book definite. Of course, form. that's the irony, yeah, mm. yeah. or the, the metaphor as well, yeah. Well, maybe we could end this by, by uh, quoting Muller Malik. He said, uh, Je suis moi fidèle au livre. Uh, I am me, uh, loyal to the book. <laughs> so, well, thank you all for attending. If you have more questions or if you want to walk around and have one of us guide you, <laughs> um, please enter conversation with these wonderful people. I want to thank you all three for coming. I'm really grateful. Oh, thanks so, for you. Thank yeah. you. Me too. Thanks.